Okay, at 6.30, we'll call the Sawyer County Board of Supervisors December 20th, 22 meeting to order, please. Madam Clerk, may we have roll call? Here. Here. Thank you. Uh, Mark Kelly. Here. Sam Duffy is excused. Marcus is excused. Here. Brian Bissonette is excused. Chris Ross. Here. John Lee Hammer. Here. Ryan Kinsley is excused. John Buckle. Present. Ed Thank you, Madam Clerk. Let the record indicate we have a quorum. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Certification of compliance with open meetings law, Madam Clerk. This meeting has been known to the public and this meeting as required by section 1924 of the Wisconsin statute. Thank you. Meeting agenda has been presented. I appreciate all of your attendance tonight at this rescheduled meeting. Moving on into public comment. Is there anyone here that wishes to address the board for public comment? Anybody online, Alex? Okay, thank you. Number eight, presentation by Sheriff Morotek, Sheriff's Department staff recognition. Sheriff. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and fellow board members. It's a pleasure to take a couple minutes and acknowledge some of our staff and a civilian for some outstanding service to our community. I wanna take a minute and explain a little bit about our policy. We have a, the Sheriff's Office has a policy for awards and uh, the policy, we have implemented a uh, awards committee if somebody within our agency or the community nominates a deputy, a law enforcement officer, or a civilian for an award for the service they rendered for the community that gets forwarded to our um, awards committee. And after the awards committee reviews it, they determine whether the actions merit an award that gets forwarded to the sheriff. And then the sheriff decides whether he or she agrees. And then the awards go from there. So with that, we did have uh, some people um, that were nominated for awards, quite a few people, and the awards committee uh, did decide that some did not merit awards and some did. So the following are the ones that uh, I agree with the committee as well and will receive the following awards. Deputy Matthias Holber, do you wanna come forward? On, October, on August 4th, 2022, you responded to an EMS call on Brubaker Lane. Upon arrival, you observed a female, later identified as Carly L. Donahue, performing CPR on another female on a boat. You assisted with performing CPR until EMS arrived. Mrs. Donahue retrieved and applied an AED to the patient with your assistance. It was confirmed days later that the patient was expected to make near full recovery due to the prompt and direct actions from you and Mrs. Donahue. I agree with the nominations committee that your actions deserve a life-saving award. Congratulations. Wow. I also want to acknowledge that Carly Donahue was nominated and she is going to receive an award as well. She lives in the Twin Cities area. She was unable to attend, but I did make, leave her a phone message, unable to contact her direct and invited her to uh, monitor on YouTube for the meeting tonight. So hopefully she's with us. The next award, awards go to deputies Logan, Price and Halber, if you want to come forward. Deputy Logan was unable to make it tonight. 
On October 29th, 2022, you responded to a structure fire on Peninsula Road where the house quickly became fully engulfed in flames. While, deputy, while these deputies were assisting, they heard a mayday call on the radio that one of the firefighters had fallen through the floor and was trapped in the basement of the burning building. Deputies Logan and Price entered the burning building to find a firefighter holding the arm of the trapped firefighter in the burning basement. Deputies Logan and Price assisted the firefighter by pulling the trapped firefighter from the burning basement. While they were exiting, Deputy Halber also entered the burning building and assisted those exiting when Deputy Logan started to give way from the floor into the burning building or into the burning basement. Deputy Holber pulled Deputy Logan to safety and assisted the firefighters and other deputies to a safe exit. I am in full agreement with the nominating committee that your courageous acts, Deputy Logan, Price, and Holber, they deserve a life-saving award. Congratulations. Deputy Joey Spurlock. In the afternoon hours of November 15th, 2022, you observed an inmate standing on the upper tier rail of a cell block in the jail. The inmate had blankets tied around his neck and to the railings. You immediately responded along with other jail staff. The inmate was refusing orders and making demands of who he wanted present when he committed suicide. When the inmate became distracted, you quickly grabbed him and pulled him off the rail. The inmate began to fight and attempted to throw you over the tier. You and fellow deputies were able to gain control of the inmate. Your actions without hesitation and willingness to put yourself at risk prevented the inmate's attempt to hang himself. I agree with the committee's nomination that you deserve a life-saving award. Congratulations. In closing, I would also like to just uh, give some honorable mention to somebody who has been a, a great service with the departure of Lieutenant Johnson. It has left a great void in our office and Chief Sedera has stepped up and fulfilled his role as chief, as well as the void that Lieutenant Johnson brought forth. It was several months before we were able to fill that position and we now have Lieutenant Wooler with us and uh, he has done an outstanding job bringing uh, Lieutenant Wooler up to speed and on board as well. So I just wanna say thank you, Chief. Remarkable, Sheriff. Thank you for sharing that with us. Okay, then we'll move on to number nine. Consider approval of our meeting minutes, November 15, 2022. Entertain a motion, Mr. Helwig. Make a motion to approve. Okay. Second by Ms. Hessel. We have a motion by Mr. Helwig, second by Ms. Hessel to approve our meeting minutes of November 15, 2022 as presented. Is there any further discussion? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Okay, number 10. Winter storm emergency disaster declaration update. And we'll start with our public health officer, Sure. Ms. Julia Lyons. Yes, and I was going to invite the sheriff as well. Thank you. Okay, so um, it's been an interesting few days since uh, Thursday evening, and um, we had the outages that began. Um, on Thursday, we'll kind of just kind of do a brief overview of the timeline, and then when sheriff's going to 
bring in some other things that we have done along the way that um, I may forget to mention. So on Thursday, we started to assess the ETA of when that power was going to be up and running. And one of the first things that we found out is it's really hard to get a good assessment from the power companies at that time when they're going through all of that. So that's going to be one of the things that we, we're, we're starting to get a little better communication methods and as we move forward. So hopefully that will be something that continues. Um, Seven Winds opened up a warming shelter, Meteor Town Hall opened, and Winter School opened on Thursday. Um, and Dispatch was uh, fielding calls for wellness, um, O2 checks, uh, concerns with cold. On Thursday evening, um, we got concerns with Galaxy Apartments that was getting quite cold. It was one of the small areas in Hayward that still wasn't um, up and running. Um, Corey Sullivan happened to have been out though um, and saw the line crew down there and was able to get them to get them up and running because we were going to try to find shelter for them that night. Uh, the other thing that happened that evening is Queen of Angels uh, down in Radisson. They ran, their power was out and their backup generator went out, unable to get that up and running. They had nine residents there. So uh, that was the big work that we were doing Thursday evening, trying to find a place for them to go. Um, we did get them uh, housed in um, at winter school because they did open up, worked with Andy Grimm. Uh, to get them moved in there, we used the special ed room. We got cots moved down there. Uh, transit came to move um, all of the residents over there. And, um, and so that's where they were housed. On Friday, we determined that we still weren't getting power up enough in the Hayward Northern area. So Wesley and Church opened as a, as a warming shelter. We opened the assembly room here at the courthouse and started 211 messaging. Um, we are still continuing to get numbers of calls for people with O2 and um, for wellness checks. We started to divvy that up in really having dispatch getting all of the O2 calls. With the 211, we were trying to move people to a public health number so that dispatch wasn't so overwhelmed with so many calls. Um, by Saturday, we still did not have power on for Queen of Angels. That became our priority. Things were falling apart with those residents living in that confined area and out of their element. Um, so that day we spent a good chunk of the day uh, trying to access generators. Um, we were able to get a generator from National Guard brought up not knowing if that power was going to be up and running or not. Um, fortunately, the power got up before the generator got there, but we do have the generator there as backup. They were able to get moved back um, by Saturday evening. And Saturday evening, winter school also closed down their shelter um, because nobody was coming in anymore. They were getting enough power on over there. On Sunday, we were still receiving reports of no power in the southern area of winter, um, or in Sawyer County in general, um, and having a hard time being able to identify who was up and who wasn't. North Central um, was working with dispatch, allowing or telling us they're calling people. If they couldn't get a hold of people, then they were bringing that forward. Law enforcement was going out and doing checks. On Monday, we were still having concerns on what was happening with uh, North Central um, and, and following up on those well, well checks. Uh, this morning, we determined that we really needed to get a very good idea of who did not have power anymore. So we did stand up our own line so that people could call in and we could then refer those people. We could make sure and or North Central knew those people did not have power, um, but also be able to assess for their wellness, whether they had generators, food, able to get out, um, those types of things. We have some next steps, but do you have some things that you would like to say along no, the no. way? Go okay. Ahead now. Um, nor, um, the next steps that we're really working on is North Central was having communication issues when they were working with their with other lines that were coming in. So we're working on getting some um, radios brought in and, so that they can communicate with other line cr crews better. Um, Jump River and Excel as we move forward into the next few days, want to consider what's going to happen there. They're not thinking that they're going to have any major outages for long periods of time, so we're going to be watching that closely. Um, 
Uh, so the other things that we're looking at is town roads and county roads seem to be clear, but we keep hearing reports that there are roads that are not clear. We've been identifying those as typically a uh, private lane road that may have been plowed at some times, but they're not getting plowed now because there's so many trees down. So we're gonna be working um, with trying to figure out how we can get DNR or other Sawyers in there to get those cleaned up. Um, preparedness messages are getting ready to go out and we started staging cots from Red Cross just in case we need to open shelters again. I'll just add a couple things here. Our dispatch center received a lot of information um, and people inquiring as to what the status was, complaining about power companies not getting back to them and uh, our dispatchers did an outstanding job. Our dispatcher supervisor, Corey Sully, has been very involved helping us making contact with the power companies as well as the other services. We, with those contacts with the power companies, especially North Central Power, we have extended offers on equipment and everything coming in. The challenge they have is it takes that trained personnel lineman to deal with the power issues. Not just anybody can go out there and clear lines to make sure that it's safe and that somebody doesn't get hurt. So that's an added uh, challenge that they have. And sometimes the public's perception is different and they don't totally understand those safety concerns as well. We have worked with Julia today trying to um, set up other means of information here. We, uh, we also received word tonight that XL Energy has offered to help uh, North Central Power with local staff here. I connected with Mike Heath this afternoon, which is their um, one of their leadership members down there. He's going to connect with XL and hopefully we can try to get everybody online tonight. He did indicate that they made they gained great headway today and got a lot more people in service that were without. Pretty much the excellent area and winter area, it appears, were the big areas. There's still going to be some dead end roads where there's miles or great distance of uh, line that's down or trees on the line, and they're just cabins. So we're really targeting the primary residents here first and uh, the more consolidated area with uh, heavier population. I also think it's important to note that Julia Lyons has really stepped up to the plate in a leadership form and fashion here. And she is the one who has really organized a lot of this moving forward, keeping the collaboration going forward, organizing the meetings, and it's went pretty well for the challenges we had ahead of us. I would agree, Sheriff. Now, are we preparing for another weather event? We, yeah, we're going to be preparing for another weather event. Um, hopefully we don't have to set up shelters, but we're looking for volunteers, trying to get things staged and ready to go, um, just in case we do have those extended power outages. It's more of a concern now because of the weather being so cold. Um, we're gonna have to really step up much more quickly than we did before with opening up those shelters. The other thing that we did do today is a hot wash. So we really went through a few things that went well and things that we can uh, work better on. Um, wanted to do that early on because we knew that we'd wanna put those things in place right away as we're probably gonna have another event we're gonna deal with. The other thing I'll mention too is our deputies have uh, actively while on patrol been monitoring those areas and watching for the residents without lights and going door to door and making sure house temperatures, if they're occupied and everything, you know, appear to be adequate and that there's no issues of concern. Additionally, I do want to mention in the town of uh, Meteor, we've had a great response with neighbors helping neighbors and a neighbor checked on another neighbor and there was somebody with a generator in the house. He was unresponsive, got emergency personnel out there, and he is currently in the hospital. So that neighbor helping neighbor um, process works well, and that saved a life without question. So we'll continue to mon monitor on the law enforcement side of things to the best of our ability. I also wanna mention that the DNR the wardens have stepped up and have been assisting us going door to door 
and have offered to help us any way they can additionally. So we've had great response from all the law enforcement agencies and, and I think it's been very collaboratively done here working together. Okay, we got one question, Sheriff, yeah. Mr. Schleter. Um, <coughs> wonderful job, you know? absolutely wonderful job. Hectic as all get out. Some of the people that I've talked to are curious, was this just that horrific of a storm or was it a partially and inadequately prepared on the parts of the power companies or inadequate, inadequate, oh, inadequate oh. upkeep of the facilities? I, you ask an interesting question and there's probably a little of both, but I think the big thing is this is just a unique storm. Talking to several town chairmen um, who are in their 70s, who have lived here their whole life, said in their lifetime they've never experienced a storm like this. I know I talked to Commissioner Gedhart and uh, Supervisor uh, Bizey, and they said in their 37 years on the highway crew, nothing has come close to a challenge like this with the road crew where you're trying to plow roads and on top of it deal with the downed trees. It's just one of those unique weather conditions where the freezing rain come in and the wet heavy snow was so heavy that the damage was just unexpected. I mean, how many of us dealing with the snow seen the blue tinge to the snow that I've never seen like that before. It was just right there at that pivotal point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the, oh, go ahead. Hessel, one second. Well, I just had one question for Julia. Uh, how is this information being made to the public? How, how are they getting so this information? We're using 211 and then um, Facebook posts and um, trying to link in now more with the townships because we're understanding that they've got more Facebook posts to be able to share. So definitely learning that and using Nixle. Mr. Buckholz. Yeah, I would just want to say too, in a lot of the townships down in our area and, and my township, <clears throat> we had to get big front end loaders out and, and big farm tractors to push trees off the road because there was no way you could cut them without somebody going to be getting hurt. I mean, it was just a disaster, mm -hmm. terrible. And I just wanted to mention that. So, we we did reach out to all the towns, um, the counties. The Sawyer County has all their uh, county roads, state roads, federal roads plowed. The towns, all of their town roads are passable. Um, there's a few fire lanes that are not plowed but it's not an issue of concern with residents. They're just um, shortcuts are used otherwise. So all of the people, when it comes to government roads, uh, to our knowledge, are all open and passable. Okay, we appreciate all of you and your whole departments and Julia, nice work. Thank you. Yep. All right, Andy, we've got a resolution that you've crafted for us uh, declaring a dash disaster. Can you comment on that, please, before we move? Yep. So yeah, on the evening or afternoon of December 15th, um, Julia was already uh, taking the wheel and uh, starting to coordinate this, the stand up of the warming shelters. As um, I think people started to realize late in the day that the power was not coming back on. So we started to hear about more demands. <clears throat> so at that time we discussed declaring a state of emergency. Um, we talked to the state of emergency management and I made that declaration. Uh, primarily just to get that uh, taken care of. So down the road here, if we can recover any costs, we can do that. That's not a guarantee. We have to meet, uh, the governor has to make a declaration as well as meet, we have to meet the thresholds for the costs that are incurred. And it also gave us the ability under a state of emergency to uh, some additional powers to the sheriff and our purchasing policies. If we needed to do some things on the, in the moment, we could do that. Uh, what this resolution does is ratifies that declaration and makes it official with the state. Okay, so this is our first step in an attempt to recover some funds and move through this. Correct. All right, pleasure of the board. Entertain a motion to approve the resolution. I'll make that motion. Okay, motion by Mr. Buckold, second by Mr. Helwig to approve the resolution, disaster declaration resolution. Is there any further discussion? If not, you in Sorry about the quick, yep. We'll use our clickers. Do 
Mr. Peters, how would you vote? Aye. And Mr. Rust? Aye. Okay. I'm closing the voting and it passes 10 to 0. Thank you. Motion carries. All right, moving on then to number 11, Zoning Committee Chair Report. Mr. Betcher. Uh, the Zoning Committee held two public hearings uh, since our last County Board meeting, one on November 17th and another one on December 16th. There were no rezone requests uh, for either of those meetings. The committee did approve one conditional use permit in November and four CUPs in December. We discussed amending the ordinance to clarify language defining multi-dwelling development versus a resort. And we have, uh, as a committee, voted to send those proposed ordinance changes out to the towns for their concurrence. So uh, we should hear back from them soon. Yeah. Uh, the committee voted in November to keep the zoning ordinance as an appendix to the Muni code, as opposed to incorporating it into the body. And the committee held a closed session in November in which no action was taken. Um, Jay should be providing a, uh, a year end update on the permit history for 2020, 2020, uh, 2022, but he'll do that next month. So pending your questions, this completes my report. Thank you, Chairman. Did I say something? Uh... No, you're good. Okay. Any questions for zoning? If not, thank you, Mr. Betcher. All right, moving on to number 12, Public Safety Committee Chair Report, Mr. Buckholtz. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the Sheriff's Department report, uh, Communication Center report, a written report was provided by Sheriff Morotek introduced uh, Deputy Carter Hartling to present uh, information regarding the electronic monitoring. Uh, they are going to establish a new detective position and dispatcher with recent approval from the county board. They have established an awards committee, which the sheriff already talked about, and with levels of service and Chief Shadera advised that it's still difficult to cover shifts. Uh, two new trainees are almost finished with training and have applied for a full-time position. Um, patrol report was uh, submitted by Lieutenant Rapinski. Uh, the jail report was provided by Lieutenant Waller. Reviewed highlights stating that the stats remain similar to the last month. Uh, Deputy Carter provided an update on the electronic monitoring system and how individuals are assigned to an electronic monitoring bracelet. And a communication uh, specialist uh, report was provided. And then uh, there's a tribal enforcement grant update, but I'm going to leave that because that's for Mr. Alvarado because that's on next on the agenda down the line. Um, code enforcement from uh, Brandon advised that he's receiving more <laughs> horse calls. Uh, and a child department report, a written report was provided by Mr. Alvarado on the MOU and the DCF and the LCO and advised that item seven on the MOU was primary, changing, identifying how payments and collections will be made. Um, there was a um, coroner's report was given by Mr. Fremel, uh, emergency management department reports. Uh, Mr. Fremel uh, advised that he's working on grant applications and working with the Berkey on race prepar preparations. And ambulance billing and ambulance report was provided. Mr. Fremel uh, re reviewed the process of going into properties that have safety concerns. Um, that ends my report, Mr. Chairman. Okay. And Mr. Alvarado, we have an appointment of Mr. Fromo, our ambulance director, also medical examiner. You wanna take that, sir? Yes. Uh, so we've, I think given a couple updates that uh, earlier this year, Nate Dunstan, who was the ambulance director and the emergency government director, um, <clears throat> resigned his position to take a position in another county. Um, he made, he was formerly the ambulance director and took the combined position at the beginning of 2022. Um, and looking, when we went through the process of filling it, uh, filling that position, we uh, took applications, did the interviews, and actually John Fromo was going to be recommended, was going to be recommended to be appointed as the ambulance director and emergency government director. He was serving in that interim role. Uh, he's been doing 
good in that role. But uh, actually in, in further discussions with the sheriff and uh, about our emergency management functions. And I think through the course of the interview process, we had uh, kind of had some good discussions about where we wanted to go and looking at what John's background is, uh, we determined and made this presentation to the public safety committee that we'd like to um, have John be the ambulance director and the medical examiner. As you're aware, he's been the coroner. Um, now that we have a medical examiner position, we can appoint that work rather than uh, having it be elected. And we're going to uh, have him operate what, what is called the emergency services department that will include the ambulance and medical examiner functions. And so what's on the agenda tonight is his appointment to that role. Uh, what we're, the next step is we are, have created a position in the sheriff's department of a communications a supervisor slash emergency government. And then moving, moving forward in the process of uh, filling that position. There's no, no net increase in positions, just reassigning duties and trying to put people in the positions where they can be successful with their, with their skills and background. Okay, so there's a there's an action item here for the board. Did the Public Safety Committee then, Mr. Buckholz, approve this? Yes. Commitment. Okay. All right. So we'll entertain a motion then approving the appointment of John Fromo as our ambulance director slash medical examiner. Correct, Mr. Alberto. Ambulance director, medical examiner. Yes. Okay, Mr. Helwig. Make that motion. Okay, motion by Mr. Helwig. Mr. Savitsky. Second. Motion by Mr. Helwig, second by Mr. Savitsky to approve the appointment of John Fromel as our ambulance director slash medical examiner. Is there any further discussion? Clickers? If not, we can vote, please. One second. <clears throat> oh, sorry. Okay. Voting is open. Mr. Russ, would you vote, please? Mr. Russ? Mr. Peters, would you vote, please? Yes. Okay, motion carries. Thank you. All right, letter C then. Resolution to approve the tribal law enforcement grant with Lacuda Ray and Sawyer County. Mr. Alvarado, do you wanna take that please? Or Mr. Bacolz, whichever. Okay. <clears throat> yes, for a number of years, the county has worked with uh, LCO on a cooperative law enforcement grant. Um, and this year we're taking a little bit different position working with the LCO on this in that we are gonna be a conduit for the grant application We'll file it, um, but they really will fund an LCO animal control program. Uh, they will receive the grant funds and utilize them for that purpose. Um, we're just a pass through entity at, at this point. How much is the grant, sir? I believe it's 38,000. Okay. okay, Mr. Buckholz. Make a motion to approve. Okay, motion by Mr. Buckholz. Second by Mr. Weaver to approve the resolution for the 2022-2023 Tribal Law Enforcement Grant. Is there any further discussion? If not, as soon as the voting is open, we'll vote. Yes. Okay. And 10 -0. okay, motion carries, thank you. <clears throat> All right, moving on then to number 13 then, Public Works Committee Chair Report. Mr. Kinsley is not here. Is there someone that can give that report? Who's vice chair? I am, I'm sorry, I'm not. No, that's okay. Mr. Alvarado, you got it? Yeah, I can give a couple updates. Uh, the committee discussed the ATV ordinance, ATV, UTV ordinance, B ordinance at length again, uh, still taking additional input and that will go back to the committee in January. I'd say it's fairly close, just trying to tie up some loose ends with uh, talking with the tribe as well as the Trail Alliance. Um, we did recognize uh, Gary Gedhart in his retirement. He was retiring on January 6th. I believe he has over 20 years with the county in the, the position. 
uh, is a wealth of knowledge and uh, he'll be missed. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have uh, proceeded on posting the highway commissioner position and are recruiting for applicants at this point. Mm -hmm. Airport discussion, um, snow removal this time of the year is the priority. And uh, we had a discussion there about our abilities to um, de-ice the runway or provide uh, put down chemicals and the cost associated with that and balancing that out with uh, there's a cost, but it also helps us keep the airport open. So we'll be working through that. Um, and I can tell you just wasn't discussed at this meeting, but just like everywhere else in the county, we had some difficulties at the airport last week getting the snow removed. Um, and then once it was off the runway, um, pushing it back further uh, so it did not uh, limit us the rest of the rest of winter um, with removing the snow and getting it off the runway. Um, and then as far as the building uh, goes, um, I think a few people took the tour tonight. Everything is still on schedule. They're still telling us a turnover date of March 10th, um, which is uh, about what, 90 days away, 80 days away. Um, other things contingent on that or opening date are getting the AV installed and the furniture fixtures. And at this point, those are all on schedule and expected to arrive and be installed. A contingency fund for the project is still still there. Um, it's at 229,000 from the original 395,000. So um, things are running as best they can right now. Um, for the most part, the building's enclosed. There are still some windows yet to be installed. Um, we saw you know, most of the offices and interior rooms are uh, framed in. Some are frame, uh, beyond framed in, but um, yeah, there'll be a lot of work to get done, but everything looks pretty good. And with our highway commissioner leaving January 6th, do we have an interim person or something we're going to put in place? Yep, the operations um, supervisor, Brad Bysey, will be the interim. Okay, Mr. Howick. Oh, Andy, what do you mean by turning over, turning it over to us on March 10th? That's After when the tour tonight, that seems... Yeah, yeah, it does seem... Uh, optimistic, but they have a pretty uh, well, well run construction schedule. So we're hoping that st stays, stays uh, the timeline. What that means though, is that that's when we should have access to that, to the new construction and start the move-in process. And there's about a uh, 10 day, 14 day window when from the date we take over there till they start working in here. Yep, uh, I know talking with, um, the judicial assistant today, they had a meeting this morning and started working on the calendar to, to choreograph that transition to the new courtroom. So we have an election for the second judge then coming up as well? Yes, papers, uh, if you wanna run for a judge, you can take out papers right now and turn them in by, I think the end, by the January 2nd? Uh, third. third. Okay. And now there'll be a spring election then for the second okay. judge. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Andy. Anything else for the public works? If not, then we'll move on to number 14, Land, Water, Forest, Resource Committee, Chair Report, Mr. Betcher. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, the committee held its monthly meeting on Wednesday, December 7th. Uh, and the LCO ATV UTV ordinance that was mentioned uh, by Andy, uh, I was told that they are in further discussion with some of the neighboring towns at this time, so it is, it is moving forward. Uh, gross timber sales are at 1.5 million for the year with more projected in December, but we might fall slightly short of our targeted goal of 1.85 million. Timber sale inspections are on track and recons are actually 50% ahead of our yearly goal. County surveyor reports that some mapping um, in and around Draper is off by as much as four to 500 feet in some areas, and they are working to correct it by this summer. The tree sales are in full swing and can be ordered through the county website. Pending your questions, that completes my report. Okay, anything for land water? If not, thank you, Mr. Betcher. Okay, moving on to number 15, Health and Human Services Board report, Chair report. Uh, I can take that one as well, if it's okay, Mr. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman. Uh, the HHS, HHS Board held its monthly meeting on Tuesday, December 6th. Uh, Child Protective Services caseworkers are currently down from five to three, uh, which is a uh, 40%. Public health reports that COVID numbers continue to remain low, while other respiratory viruses, especially, especially influenza, are on the rise. And Round Lake Town is conducting a groundwater study. 
They've already tested 87 households with a goal of 120 to complete their study. There's been a few cases of elevated manganese and lead, but otherwise the groundwater is good. Pending your questions, that completes my report. Thank you, sir. Okay, if there's no further questions, then we'll move on to number 16, Finance Committee Chair Report. Okay, and that was for Mr. Kinsley as well. Who's our Vice Chair in Finance? Yep, nope, that's great, Mr. Reagan. Okay, Andy, Finance Committee. I think we'll cover most of it under your Under yours? Okay, all right. All right, so then we move on to 16B. It's a resolution approving county signatory authority. Can you explain that for us, Andy, please? Sure, and actually, uh, kind of the, where this started is that uh, during my time here, um, I haven't seen a lot of necessarily what I would consider a lot of the contracts to, to review and approve. Talk to the chairman about how many he's signed, and it seems a little light that maybe um, we needed just to tighten up our contract approval process. Because as departments enter or have contracts, grant agreements, we do want the opportunity to review them. If we need be, have council review them, and then make sure the appropriate person who's able to can sign on behalf of the county. So um, number two there is the approval form that I developed just to have something to document contracts. And this is also helpful at the end of the year when the auditors wanna look through our uh, expenses, they can find a contract to back up what we're expending funds on. Um, but then in discussions with Corp Council about um, and just having them review the contract approval form, they raised the issue of just making sure we have something that authorizes the county administrator to sign certain documents. Um, there are certain things that the chair and the county clerk uh, have to sign, but there's a number of other ones that could be signed by either one. So this would, and I believe based on what I found from uh, past uh, prior administrator, it was signing a number of just day-to-day -day contracts like the garbage contract or um, other service provider type contracts. You know, there's other things like um, county minister can't borrow money on behalf of the county or buy property on behalf of the county. Um, but these would be more of the day-to-day uh, -day things just to, um, I guess, simply ratify my signature on, on those types of things when they come up. So you're, you would be acting on the resolution for approving county signatory authority. Yep. And this has passed through the finance committee recommended to the full board. Yep. So entertain a motion to approve the resolution, Ms. Hessel. I'll make that motion. Okay. I'll second. Okay, motion by Ms. Hessel, second by Mr. Righeimer, approving the resolution, approving county signatory authority. Is there any further discussion? If not, Madam Clerk, can we open the polls? Okay, vote, please. Mr. Ross? I think he lost his internet connection. Okay, Mr. Peter. I vote aye. Uh, 10 zero. Okay. okay, motion carries, thank you. All right, 16C, resolution to consider a county investment policy. Mr. Alvarado, please. Yes, this is another uh, item that uh, came about in the last couple of months. Um, compared to a year ago when we weren't getting any return on our money, the interest rates have increased. So now there's actually some uh, decent uh, returns on CDs or the state, uh, state investment pool or uh, WISC, which we have some of our funds in uh, for the building project, um, which brought to the question of how we are investing our, our county funds. Um, again, talking with uh, some other similar counties, uh, they have an investment policy in place that guides the actions of the county as to what can be, um, where and how those monies can be invested to generate a return that uh, falls within the state statutes. So a lot of what's in this policy is based on what's allowable in state statute. The, I brought this to the committee uh, with the intent of having an investment committee that would um, take care of those actions. Uh, the finance committee, um, decided that it would be best for the finance committee to act as the investment committee. And so the resolution establishes an investment policy. Um, item two under there is the original proposal. And then item three is the amended investment policy that takes and puts the finance committee as the investment committee. So my recommendation would be to somebody to amend the resolution to add in or to include 
the amended investment policy. Mm -hmm. And then you can take so action. So we can on the approve resolution. the resolution that amends the policy. You want to, before you approve the resolution, I would amend it okay. to make sure that's the, uh, the amended investment policy that's attached to the resolution. Okay. And obviously pass through finance and recommend it to come here. For yep. I will look at our finance committee for this. Ms. Hessel. I will make a motion to approve the amendment attached to the investment policy. I'll second. Okay, thank you. Motion by Ms. Hessel, second by Mr. Righeimer to mm -hmm. approve the resolution and amendment for the investment policy. Good with that? Okay, is there any further discussion? I have a- Yes, Mr. Betcher. Yeah, uh, Andy, does this, would this include uh, any or all monies uh, received through the carbon credit? This would, this would cover all monies under the management of the county or under the control of the county. So at, at the point when the carbon credit money were to be received, um, yes, the investment policy would cover that money. Okay, I just was reading it says all except for funds and certain restricted and special uh, funds. So I didn't know if that was included. Okay, thank you. Yep, that, I mean, you can't, just to clarify, so if it's in a restricted fund or um, or is governed by some rules that uh, I'm trying to think of an example of this. Um, most of our monies have to be segregated like the opioid money, but doesn't limit how you could invest it. But there might be monies that you can't, well, just like um, bond money. Because of arbitrage, they don't let you borrow at one rate and invest at another up to a certain limit. So the investment committee would have to follow, you know, follow that policy then. Sure. Okay, I have a motion to approve. The polls are open. Please vote. One second. Okay. Want us to vote again? Uh, now, hold on. Yes. Okay. One. I vote aye. And who shall that vote? And it is 10-0. Okay, motion carries. Thank you. All right, 16D then. Personnel plan, pay grid, and wage adjustment. Discussion and possible action, Mr. Alvarado. Yes, so uh, with the budget adopted last month, um, we did not address the uh, 2023 wage and personnel levels. I had uh, pulled that back. Um, at that point, we had not um, entered into negotiations with the union, um, and we were going to try to have that completed before we addressed the rest of the employee wages. But at this point, we don't expect to have a union contract until sometime in 2023. So we considered um, at the finance committee and, and also the administration administrative committee uh, what we wanted to do with non-represented employees. And the resolution uh, provides a recommendation of a 2% wage adjustment to all non-represented employees affected the first full payroll of 2023 and an additional 1% wage adjustment to those same employees uh, on the first full payroll of July 1st. And so the resolution covers the uh, increases and then what's it Attach is supporting is the adjusted pay grids, how they'll look um, as of the first payroll in July, excuse me, the first payroll in January and the first payroll in July, and then the full-time equivalent employee accounts by department for 2023. So this is a 3% increase? Two or and two one. Point, two, two and one. one. Two initially and then one in July. Yes. Sir. Okay. Ms. Hessel. I make a motion to approve the Resolution for the pay increase. Okay. I'll second. Okay. Motion by Ms. Hessel, second by Mr. Righeimer, approving the 2023 wage increase resolution. And the vote is open. Voting is open. Mr. Peters. Mr. Peters, would you like to cast a vote? I, I vote aye. Sorry. Okay, motion carries. Okay, thank you everyone. We'll move on then to number 17, Economic Development UW Extension. And that chair is- Mr. Oh, I'm, the, yes. I'm the vice, I'm thank ready you, for that Mr. one. I am ready for that one. We thank met on, you, sir. <laughs> we met on Vice December. chairman, thank you. 
Thank you. We met on December 5th. Um, Hayward Lakes Lakes and Visitors Convention Bureau uh, submitted a written report. Northwest Regional Planning Commission, Mr. Pearson provided review of their activities. They had their annual meeting on December 7th at Flat Creek. Several bounce back recipients um, spoke at that meeting. This program is wrapping up December 27th. They've had 10 inquiries since September regarding the revolving loan fund program. Uh, economic development report, Ms. Uh, Barrito Ross provided a report on the activities of the Sawyer County LCO Economic Development Committee. Um, they're improving their website, they said. Um, they had a placemaking event at LCO, which about 12 people attended. Uh, they welcomed Andy Alvarado as a new member at large on their board. And she reported that they uh, have some grant funds available for entrepreneurs and they advertised that in the paper. It was a library update, written reports, written reports were provided. Ms. Link Jones provided a calendar of events and advised that the library is applying for new grant funds for specific projects. And they are also sending out holiday fundraising letter. The uh, motorized, non-motorized trail report was given by Ms. LaRue um, and she reported that they are transitioning to snowmobile since that is the season now. And so they are changing their data counters to a new location. And that ends my report. Thank you, sir. Any questions for economic development? If not, we'll move on then to number 18, Municode update, discussion and possible action. Mr. Alvarado, you've worked on this for months. Yeah, months and people before me worked on this for months. Yes. And so this is uh, still at the point where we're just trying to get the Municode um, Book of Ordinances adopted. And what you have, um, the Code of Ordinances, what, what's there is the ordinances for the county through December uh, 16th of 2021. Uh, we've gone back and reviewed and reviewed. Um, there was a discussion at the Zoning Committee about whether the zoning ordinances should be incorporated into the Book of Ordinances or left in an appendix. Their, their, their motion was to leave them in the appendix. That's what went back through the administrative committee. Um, so the, the code of ordinances is a living document. We're never done with this. And so this is just a matter of getting our, our first code of ordinances adopted and published. We already have a first supplement in the process of things that have already been amended in the last year since this was compiled. Um, and then I already have other departments uh, that'll be working with their committees on updates to the ordinance. We're always looking at updates or, um, you know, the, the health department is uh, going to be bringing some forth some suggested uh, amendments to the ordinance. Uh, the ATV UTV ordinance, whenever and if that's adopted, that would amend the ordinance. So this is just establishing the code as of where it was December 16th of 21. Um, anytime now going forward, you, when you approve a new ordinance, um, let's go through the same process, but then we provide it to Muni Code and they update the book of ordinances, and then we have an online code of ordinances that anybody can access and they keep that current for us as well. So the ones you've already amended or approved in the last year, when we when the supplement is published, will automatically be put into the code. Wonderful. And so this, this resolution so, uh, allows you to adopt the code as it's written. Anything um, in the last year is still, still not voided. It just uh, has to be codified yet. Okay, so it's your recommendation then that we approve this resolution adopting the Municode ordinance? Correct. Okay. And I'd suggest a voice vote. Mr. Betcher. I'd like to make a motion to approve the Municode as presented. Mr. Helwig. I'll second that motion. Okay, motion by Mr. Betcher, second by Mr. Helwig. Do a voice vote. Okay. Approving the, adopt, the resolution and the adopted Municode ordinance. Excuse me, I meant roll call vote. Oh, roll call vote. Okay. Yes, sorry. Is there any further discussion? It is open. Okay, Mr. Alber Alberato is requesting a roll call vote. Roll call vote, Madam Clerk, please. Your clickers will work. It is open. Would you like to take a call instead? No, as long as that will show the show the number of votes. Yes. Oh, okay. That's fine. Polls are open. We can vote, Madam Clerk? Yes, it should be. Okay. Okay. Yes. 
It's not taking it. Okay, let's do a roll call vote by voice. Okay. Mr. Venter. Yes. Mr. Frieder. Yeah. Mr. Human. Yes. Mr. Weaver. Yes. Uh, Ms. Hutzel. Yes. Mr. Helway. Aye. Mr. Zabitsky. Yes. Mr. Rust. Oh, he lost him, didn't he? Mr. Yep. Rickman. Yes. And Mr. Buckles? Yes. Mr. Peters? Yes. Okay, motion carries. Thank you. Good work, Andy. <clears throat> All right, number 19, County Administrator's Report. Yeah, I'll give, a verbal, tonight. I'll give a verbal report and then get something out in writing here once we okay. get a little further along. Um, just some updates on the employee front. Um, talking with the administrative committee, I had, I had looked at uh, proposing PTO rather than a vacation sick leave uh, system. Um, pulled that back. Instead, we're going to be looking at all of the employee benefits in the first quarter of next year. Um, top to bottom, uh, we're looking at changes to the health insurance. And if we're going to be looking at uh, those types of significant changes, um, I want opportunity to propose a uh, new employment, uh, new employee benefits uh, um, top to bottom. In negotiations, we did have our first uh, negotiating uh, session with the union last week. Um, we did not get it settled in the first meeting. So we'll be having uh, subsequent meetings um, probably into, well into January. Um, we had wellness day uh, today for the employees. I think that went well for the first time, just trying to get employees focused on um, physical and mental health. Um, I'm in the middle of annual reviews with department heads. Thank you for those of you who have given me some um, information or uh, feedback to discuss with departments. Uh, Greg and I did a carbon credit kickoff meeting um, yesterday. So um, that will start getting more intense, especially for Greg and his staff to provide information to a new. And then on the economic development front, <clears throat> um, like Mr. Righeimer noted, I'm, I'm part of the uh, at-large member, uh, uh, ex officio of the Economic Development Corporation. But prior to that, um, I collaborated a little bit with them on the grant that they uh, submitted to Northwood Technical College. I provided a letter of support for the county and will be helping on that. That was in the newspaper last week where the Technical College uh, is looking for a, to cite uh, a housing and workforce uh, training centers around the region. So Hayward is one of the four that that's been selected, uh, approximately $2 million project. So we're looking to partner with them and see that project to, uh, to its implementation. Uh, just an update on some of the other items we've been working with. Like has been mentioned, the child support MOU with LCO is pretty close to being um, done. We've approved it on our side. 161 agreement uh, with human services for child placements is pretty close as well. We're still talking about the ATV UTV ordinance and you approved the uh, tribal uh, the cooperative tribal law enforcement grant tonight. So we're getting through some of those things. Wonderful. Any questions for Andy on his county administrator's report? No. Okay, if not, then we'll move on to number 20, closed session pursuant to Wisconsin statute 19.851E deliberating or negotiating the purchase of public properties, the investing in public funds, or conducting other specified public business whenever competitive or bargaining reasons require a closed session. And considering financial, medical, social, or personal histories or disciplinary data of specific persons, preliminary consideration of specific personal problems, or the investigation of charges against specific person, except where Par B applies, which if discussed in public would be likely to have substantial adverse effect upon the reputation of any person referred to in such histories or data or involved in such problems or investigations. Entertain a motion. Mr. Buckholz. I make a motion to go okay. in a closed session. Mr. Helwig. Second. Motion by Mr. Buckholz, second by Mr. Helwig to go in a closed session. And I do need a roll call vote for this, correct, Mr. Alberto? Yes, Mr. Clickers, we can click. Motion to go on the closed session. Please Mr. vote. Peters, would you vote please? I vote yes. And is Mr. Rust back on? I don't see him. And <laughs> oh, we have, let's see. Mr. Schlater's vote didn't pass. Would you cast a vote, Mr. Schlater? Just let me know what it is. I thought I did. That's okay. Go ahead and let me know what it is. Yes. Okay. So then we have 10 0. 
Okay, motion carries. We're in closed session, 7.30 p.m. And this is Mr. Buckholz regarding our transit manager and it's for information only to the board. Put together information like this to help keep uh, county supervisors and staff informed on the data side of things. Okay, thank you. And with that, we're adjourned everyone. Travel safe and stay warm.